Good evening. I'm Mark Harris. Uh, welcome to Diversa TV. Uh, we may actually get into the issue of historical trauma, but um, uh, that's usually a sophisticated understanding from this particular perspective. Uh, if you are new to the show, welcome. If you are a, one of our growing legion of uh, watchers, um, welcome back. Uh, tonight, we'll, this is our fifth season. Uh, if you go to slide, gentlemen. Uh, Diversa TV, this is our fifth season, which our seasons roughly um, correspond to LCC terms. Uh, today we're looking at an Anglo perspective with Annette, our guest tonight, Annette Leonard, who's the Lane County Performance Development and Diversity Coordinator. Diversa TV's mission is to illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. Uh, and since this is being run through LCC, um, I am a member of Diversity Council and a past uh, interim chief diversity officer. So one of the things that we look at in terms of diversity in L LCC is beyond the usual rubric of race and ethnicity to also look at class, age, occupation, uh, as a addictions worker, it's drug of choice, it's choice of addictions, it's hidden disabilities, it's all kinds of different things. Uh, so if we go to slide again, our, our schedule usually follows uh, this pattern, and so you can count on this. So we're on Turtle Island, so we always start with a native perspective. And then usually we'll go, because we're speaking English and that is an Anglo language, then we usually do the Anglo perspective. Uh, then we also then go to Africans in America, uh, Latino, Asian, and then we get beyond race and ethnicity through the Federal Five by the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, queer, questioning, intersex, two-spirit. Population. Tran population. Oh, yeah. T could also be trans for that matter. Yeah. Uh, disability youth, class, and we'll probably end up uh, finals week talking about spirituality and religion. And uh, as guests availability change, we can ch switch this up at any time. So keep tuned in because you never know what's up. So when we talk about Anglo diversity issues, uh, stay on the slide, if you will. So depending on who's doing the talking, uh, diversity, multiculturalism, liberalism, plurality, all these code names for referring to issues involving, depending on your perspective, people of color or people who are quote unquote other or different than the wealthy college edu educated heterosexual white male Protestant Romanized Christian norm of society. And the reason I made this distinction about Romanized is because if you were tuning in earlier to my ethnic studies class, we talked about there's a whole branch of Christianity that uh, worshiped using the text in the language that Yeshua spoke in and has never gone on programs of genocide or slavery or whatever to this day. Mm -hmm. So we only hear about Christianity from the Romans perspective, not from the respective of the East. So while white people are often characterized as in, within this rubric as quote unquote allies, and we can also engage in discussions of who is white, for example, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. are Jews white? Uh, is whiteness and is whiteness limited in appearance to skin coloration or can it be attitudes and beliefs as well? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we look at in terms of public institutions, certainly here at Lane and other institutions since our CEOs just signed a memorandum of understanding uh, in terms of looking at diversity issues, the you know, 12 largest public employers, which is the county and the city and cities of Springfield and Eugene and the U of O and Lane Community College and LTD, to name a few. Yeah. <laughs> All our CEOs just signed this memorandum of understanding recommitting to diversity so what does it mean to develop a diversity plan if you're a public institution? Why would people be hired, retained, evaluated, possibly disciplined for their lack of skills or their skills 
in diversity related issues. And what is a diversity coordinator? Yeah. Well, tonight we have one if these were burning questions for you. Yeah. Uh, please welcome Annette Leonard, who is a performance development and diversity coordinator for Lane County. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, glad to have you finally. <laughs> At, <here>. last. <laughs> At last. So, what's your job entail? Well, my job is a hybridization of two positions. So previously, Lane County had a performance and development coordinator and a diversity coordinator. Mm. And uh, when budgets were tight and the person left the performance and development position, the whole of that job was then also put on the, the shoulders of the person doing diversity coordination. Of course. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. That was about five years ago now. The, and so performance and development in the minds of most people relates to training. Yes. People think of right. me as the right. holder of the training calendar, the generator right. of county-wide and county-sponsored trainings, uh, the person who pays attention to organizational development and uh, some amount of performance coaching and performance management. Hmm. The, and then the diversity component of this position has, gosh, at least 10 years of history at the county. And it was a position created to start to pay attention to, are we culturally competent as an organization? Are we? You can actually have that conversation uh, without argument? Hmm. <laughs> well, theoretically, yes. <laughs> with many, not yes. with all, certainly yes. not with right. all. But uh, I think some of that, of course, is social pressure. Some mm -hmm. of that, of course, is politicking. And some of that is genuine interest and along with that a fair dose of genuine opposition as well yes yeah no doubt yeah uh well just like here just like anywhere you know yeah. i guess uh, in sometimes i pinch hit and sometimes i sit in on you know the idec meetings as mm. you know as i've seen you there right yeah. so uh the question of cultural competency for example at the u of o and the diversity plan getting some pushback from mm -hmm. faculty members, what does it mean, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Certainly in Lane's Diversity Council, we've looked at, oh, well, what's a diversity class? Yeah. How do you determine what, you what's a diverse that? astronomy class? Right? You know, right. what is it, you know, what, if we're putting that rubric, what, it, what does that mean yep. then? To infuse the curriculum, what yeah. would that really look like? Right. Mm -hmm. to, yeah, to infuse the curriculum. Oh, mm -hmm. what is a diverse hire? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, how does that look like, you know, mm -hmm. affirmative action? Because you don't have necessary affirmative action for, you know, people outside of the federal five. Yep. Right? Correct. Um, and Lane County is not an affirmative action organization. Okay. All right. Uh, and Lane Community College has chosen to remain mm -hmm, one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what does that look like? Right. Too? And what does it mean if we are or if we aren't? Yes. The hmm. So... All that mm. is in your job description? A fair bit of that. I'm also the person who oversees our EEO plan and okay. EEO reporting, doing our EEO 4, and um, am the, one of the front people to receive harassment or discrimination complaints. So it's okay. my name that's on the form in terms of if you have a harassment discrimination complaint, here's the person to report it to. Okay. But um, people who work for the organization or citizens and guests uh, are absolutely welcome to submit that complaint to someone else. So if there's someone that feels more relevant or more appropriate, I'm not the only person who receives those complaints. So does that include like the human rights advisory? Mm, thing? Used to. Yeah, used to? It used okay. to. So the, my predecessor in this position, Laura Jurgen, okay. also oversaw the human rights, uh, now called the Lane County Commission for the Advancement of Human Rights. Okay. And when the task force reconfigured what that uh, committee or commission was going to be, they actually took that committee and, and created a new halftime position to be staffed to it and relocated it in the uh, county administrator's office. Okay. So. Van Vactor? The no longer Jeff oh, right. Sparts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You need a scorecard to keep no track doubt. of the players. <laughs> All the changes. <laughs> so we need t performance, you know, uh, and cultural competency because, mm. you know, competent, you know, the reason that term was actually even coined is okay competence is a skill set yeah. and what you actually do yeah. so if you were to you know evaluate someone's performance are, mm -hmm. are people's performance evaluated on their cultural competence they are they are yeah who the all lane county employees this is a change that came with our wow. diversity action plan uh, which was 
composed in 2005 and over the course of about the next year and a half, some of the first initiatives outlined in that plan were then rolled out across the various departments. And just over a year ago, less than two years ago, we implemented a countywide evaluation on cultural competency. So mm. it is one of the questions on everyone's performance evaluation that is meant to be done annually. And our performance evaluations are standard across the county and, and uh, the supervisor is allowed to rate the significance of each of the different questions. But uh, cultural competency and I think one or two other are questions that they may not give a scoring of how important it is, which is mm. to say you can't, you can't dumb down how important you think this is in your job just mm. because you think that person only interacts with no one because they sit in a cubicle all day, the, they're answering the phone, they're providing right. customer su support and services. The, and so the interesting second wave question, which of course has followed, is around, so what about managers and supervisors who may themselves not be models of cultural competency evaluating someone else's cultural competency. Mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting conundrum. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. around when they when they put that performance measure into effect and it was seen as a triumph in terms of getting enough buy-in to make this be a county-wide performance rating. Yeah. And yet probably 2 months ago at our diversity action committee we heard people lamenting that change and feeling really frustrated and sad about the fact that there are supervisors who are doing these evaluations who themselves are not upholding standards of cultural competency. And so the conversation has been renewed in terms of what does this mean, what training is needed for people to even understand what it means, much less how to use it. Right. And my perspective at the moment on that question is a lot about the opportunity that this provides for engaging in these dialogues. You know, the opportunity to once a year sit down with your supervisor and say, okay, developmentally, what would you like to do to enhance your cultural competency this year? Well, you know, I work for Public Works and um, I spend a lot of time in our parks and open spaces and I'm frustrated by the ill effects that I see of indigent or homeless populations. So rather than just be frustrated, maybe I need to educate myself about life experience of people who don't necessarily have a home in Lane County. And so my goal is around that. You know, okay. how relevant then okay. would that be to next right. year sit down and talk about what did you learn? Well, I learned that it makes more sense for us to leave our bathrooms unlocked at night and clean up the graffiti than it does to clean up the mess of not having our bathrooms <laughs> unlocked tonight or, you know, whatever the outcome might be, but to let people find relevant ways to self-initiate around areas of cultural competency. Argument to believe, and that's not a word, the, one could also sort of argue that, that that's not going to push the envelope, that's not right. going to get people over the biggest hurdles, and yet, you know, are we doing this by drawing people out or are we doing this by pushing them from behind? And I think it takes both in so different cases. Both. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, I, and I was just thinking, to, you know, to the county's credit, because I remember the whole battle around renaming Centennial to Martin Luther King Boulevard, and it was basically the county that spring for the cost of the signs. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? Yep. Not the city. Nope. <laughs> yep. It was our sign right? shop that put this together. And yeah. yeah. And so looking at, you know, that whole issue about, you know, community collaborations and, you know, uh, two different issues. Yeah. Two <laughs> different county commissioners, you know, one white, one black, basically saying, okay, how do we, you know, do this? I mean, part mm -hmm. of that backstory is, you know, yeah. Bill Dwyer says, okay, it, you know, let's, Try. I'm tired of this Springfield against Eugene thing. Let's do something to tie us all together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's find a street that runs through Eugene and Springfield yeah. and rename it. Yeah. So you got two choices there: Franklin or Centennial. Uh -huh. And you know, even Bill said, you know, kind of off the record, but you know, you know, out him for that. You know, for the acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. well, you if you use Centennial, probably can't run it too deep into Springfield. Uh -huh. Right, and so you're right. You know, that's essentially part of the decision. Yeah. Part of the decision. Yep. <laughs> right. You bet. But uh, yeah, and there were some interesting politics around that mm -hmm. too. But you know, that's a struggle that we've had at Lane in terms of looking at pushing the standard of cultural competence. Who you know, is it applying to all employees? Is it you know, who gets to administer or decide who's culturally competent? Yeah. 
et cetera. And yeah. what does that mean? Who's pushing for that agenda? Push, yeah, right. Uh -huh. Agenda. Right. Agenda. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. yeah, I mean, given that we are both named for a Indian fighter that was somewhat segregationist in his outlook, mm -hmm. How That's, do we our do it? That's our right? starting place. That's our starting place. That's our history. How do we do it? That's our history. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I guess in that tension between, because organizations are made of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that tension between, okay, if I want to, you know, educate myself on the homeless, mm -hmm. that's that's allowed. And mm -hmm. then, what about the organization? Mm -hmm. In terms of, okay, you're not an affirmative action. Organization. Organization. True. But you do have an EEO plan. Yeah. So how do you work that then? Well, the... From the hiring aspect, because people usually ask that, and that's how people first approach diversity, even though it's, you know, more than just check what box you can check, or even if there is a box for you to, to check. check. Yeah. 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 The not being an expert yet in our personnel matters in terms of all okay. of the answers to those questions. I can say that I've worked closely with our personnel manager to understand the diversity initiatives and efforts that they take on. The, so when it comes to being uh, EEO compliant rather than affirmative action, I learned from our county council, because this was an education for me, that we were never mandated to become an affirmative action employer, hmm. which is the way that most employers become an affirmative action employer, is that okay. enough people have sued them and proven a history of discrimination that they needed to do that, you know, hence the affirmative part of that action, right, you know, that we're right, doing this to right, affirm that we're right. not discriminating against people. Right. The, and so we do take on some of the practices informally that relate right. to affirmative action, not in terms of preferential treatment or additional points or higher scores for whatever box you might have checked on your form, but in terms of working with the committees who will be selecting a candidate to say, so in this position, we typically give you the five top folks based on our compilation of scores. What we can say to you is that in those five, you have two female and three male applicants, and um, at this point, no ethnic or racial diversity. If you'd like to expand your group of candidates that you're interviewing to your top eight, you can include these different ratings at this percentage or at this number. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, committees will be open to and receptive to have that kind of intrusion. Again, we're not telling them the names of those five people, so then they know the names of the other three. We're just saying, right. you know, if you went only with the top five. So that's right. part of the way that uh, that we start to look at diversity once people already have their application and I think one of the areas where um, we do a fair to average job is in the advertising of our positions making sure that we're including broad perspectives in terms of where we are publishing our advertisements for openings but I think one of the limiting processes that it would be really useful for us to get to examine a little more thoroughly is about whether our application process itself is actually very accommodating or accessible. I think, yeah, I mean, because there's a lot you just threw out there, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess because our hit, our organizations have some parallel history. Sure. Um, even though we're a different type of employer, we do yeah. actually do employ from the same base pool. You know, yeah. The same pool in a lot of ways. So you know, when you were talking about eight percent, okay, so that that number, where those numbers come from, so people understand this isn't a vacuum, you know, the mm -hmm. quote unquote quota thing, mm -hmm. okay. This is an actual percentage of who is working in your local hiring area. You bet. As put okay. out by the feds. I mean, that's As defined by the feds. Data, yeah. And yeah. you get to define what your local hiring is. Yeah. Hiring. Okay. So, yeah, a county can basically say the state or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. right? Well, we're higher education. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, depends on what it is. So, for a classified person, person that doesn't work in the classroom, mm -hmm. all right, so our local hiring area is, you know, depending on what the job is, is the state or the Northwest. Sure. And we do advertise, so that's not, you know, we advertise all over the place, so that's not an issue. If it's faculty, it's the nation, mm -hmm. and with the internet, the world. You bet. Right? So when we look at that question, mm -hmm. and, and as we have looked at, at that question, you know, with my particular demographic, mm -hmm. all right, so we have 250 full-time faculty here, mm -hmm. right? So African Americans already make up 10% of faculty in higher ed. 
So theoretically, then, the applicant pool yep, but could the, be 25 African-American faculty at Lane. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, actu the actuality, you know, mm -hmm. where the rubber meets the road, and mm -hmm. uh, well, there's never been more than six in the entire history. Lane has never hired more than 40 African-Americans in its entire history, which is less than one a year. As faculty? As anything. Right? So it's not who comes to Eugene, you yeah. know, if, it, if we're talking about faculty, it's okay, there are some barriers mm -hmm. in there. You know, you talked about point systems. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at one point, you know, well, if you were a part timer, you got double points for working here in your hire, which is illegal. <laughs> and those people were drawn <laughs> from the U of O, right? Uh -huh. So uh -huh. it has been a learning process sure. for our institution. So sure. You know, for your institution, have you had, for example, discrimination complaints filed against you in terms of looking at hiring? You, you said you have that has not happened, or uh, is that the usual mechanism? That is the mechanism, and I okay. will say that we certainly have had complaints filed against us. Okay. The my understanding from our counsel at the county is about that those never went to a court who said, okay. yes, there is a history of discrimination, you know, and I can argue that that's because they didn't get to the right court, you know, it might yeah, be possible right. that many of those were settled, that uh, a variety of different factors, but yeah. for whatever reason, we were never mandated. Okay. Yeah. So, with the issue of diversity, what kind of diversity and who does it apply to? Mm -hmm. Well, our diversity action plan, the one okay. that was composed in right. 2005, is a pretty impressive model of bringing together interested participants, community members, all levels of the organization to initiate conversations around diversity. So not having been an employee of the county at that time, I don't have an insider's lens. Okay. I have a after the fact looking back and talking and learning from other people's lens, which to me said this was a really thorough engaged process and the plan itself which is in excess of 35 pages outlines Lane County as a funder, Lane County as an employer, Lane County as a service provider mm -hmm. and talks about how to incorporate diversity across each of those different sort of uh, roles that we that we play. And the definition of diversity that comes at the very front end of that diversity plan talks about diversity in it's sort of postmodern way in my perspective, which is to say, uh, we don't just mean the big federal ones. We also mean protections around sexual orientation, around religion, politics, family, national origin, on and on and on and on and on. And essentially said, you know, diversity is us. Mm -hmm. We are all diverse in a variety mm -hmm. of ways. And so that is the perspective from which our county administrators signed on and, you know, high up honchos, big directors and managers at the county. The way that that takes shape is really interesting because I think one of the arguments it um, poses for many of us is around, okay, so each of us is unique, each of us is individual, and yet, are we talking about historical ill? Are we talking about the effects of long-term oppression? Or are we talking about, we all belong? <laughs> we are the one. Exactly, <laughs> and and so there's some amount, I. I heard, um, oh, I can't think of his name. He's a uh, vice president up at OSU. Oh, um, Dr. Roker? Yes. Not Roker, not Roker. Um, Ro. Uh, I know who you're talking about, too. Uh, <laughs> Black guy. And I can't think of his name. Yeah, right. Heard him talk recently. Ro Larry Roper. There it is, Roper. Yeah. Uh, talk uh, with the Corvallis, city of Corvallis, yeah. who is writing their new diversity plan, and they invited several of us to come talk to them about our diversity plan. Heard him talk about, well, from the outset, I would recommend that you all talk about whether or not this diversity plan is about equity or equality. And then he went on to say, and I will not do justice to his distinction, but in my own words, I will say that, that he talked about equality as, let's give everybody the same. So if I'm giving you $5, I'm going to give everybody else $5. But equity is about, okay, who hasn't gotten $5 every year for the past, you know, century or two? And let's make sure that they get their $5. And, and that mm. equity, the message of equity resonates with me in terms of, you know, what gets lost when we start to right. talk about diversity as all of us right. is the particular reason why I think we 
needed in the first place or still need initiatives around diversity and equity, which yeah. is to say, you know, those who have been without, those who have been historically marginalized and oppressed uh, deserve first comeuppance. What's problematic in my mind, there are a myriad of ways that that's problematic, but one of the ways that I think most people focus first on is around sort of diversity as a zero-sum game. You know, as soon as we pull out the D word, as soon as we say diversity, people start scrambling for what am I going to lose? What are they going to take right. away from right. me? Instead of what is this going to add to all of us? What is this going to benefit all of us? How is this going to enrich each of our experiences? Right. The And so how do we, question for myself, how do we work toward equity in a way that shows everyone the benefit and the value? Right when the benefit and the value is first being applied to those who have historically been oppressed and marginalized. And, um, you know, I mean, just a segue off of what you just said. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, in the interest of, you know, upholding a certain journalistic standard, yeah. right, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, yeah. I will say that the Human Rights Commission did uh, contribute some money mm -hmm. to I2M Eugene mm -hmm. for the specific purpose of raising a headstone to Wiley Griffin, who was the first, not the first African American, but the first African American mentioned in the historical record, yeah. okay, um, to live here and for his headstone. Uh, as I was telling my ethnic studies class earlier today, um, Cemeteries in all the pioneer cemeteries in Eugene, as was the the case throughout the South as well, mm -hmm. were segregated by race. Okay, and Wiley, <laughs> you know, even though he did have a headstone when he was when he died and was buried in 1913, that headstone was lost probably in like '59. And mm -hmm. apparently, where he's buried is a section where um, there's unmarked graves. So while there are a few people scattered like, you know, throughout the cemetery in specific graves where, you know, friendly whites allowed a Chinese family to be buried, for example, in the Lucky Plot, right, mm -hmm. at night, <laughs> right, <laughs> he, you know, here we go. All right, so people who have traditionally not gotten their $5 or not gotten their headstone or whatever, yeah. all right. They're here, Wiley gets a headstone, and you know they'll get put up. You know, as soon as we clean up the site and identify where you know, the body actually is, you know, yeah. of, you know, specifically, so that we can put it at the head of the headstone, yeah. et cetera. But and so I had to disclose that. But mm -hmm. also looking at one of the reasons you bring in, in the interest of equity, because I like, you know, I understand what Larry was talking about mm -hmm. with that, mm -hmm. okay? The equity versus equality piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the reasons you bring in people into, for example, our workforce is not necessarily because they've been historically discriminated against, mm -hmm. but taking the fact that they have been historically discriminated against and they tend not to want to discriminate or be discriminated against or look out for other folks. Yeah. All right? Yeah. So when we have, for example, you know, giving a shout out to an ancestor here, okay, um, head of, once head of the math department who asked the question and apparently was the first person to ask the question, okay, why do people have to take algebra five times before they pass. I mean, all students. Here at Lane. Here at Lane. This question was All asked. students, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Not just students of color, but all students, yeah. right? When us math teachers are the math teacher, are the people that took it first time, every time, what's so special about us and why can't we do that Teach for other students? Teach it once and have them get it. <laughs> and by the way, here's the model I want to use. Mm -hmm. I want to use the model of uh, another Harvard-trained mathematician who, oh, happens to be black, mm -hmm. happens to be a former SNCC organization mm -hmm. uh, person who thinks that algebra is a civil rights issue. Mm. Like, if you don't get algebra in middle school, you don't go to college. Yep. And so maybe if we made math more friendly for mm -hmm. folks, not dumb it down, mm -hmm. but increase access for everybody, we have better student retention. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
So, you know, now we didn't hire him just because he happened to be black, but he did happen to be black, yeah. and he and did. And he broke down barriers, and or he, he attempted to break down uh, barriers, but he got pushed back uh -huh. <laughs> because he was black. Right, and it was a <laughs> radical notion. And it, it was the zero-sum game. This yes. is how we teach math. Why is he trying to take that away from me? Yeah, except... I'm good at what I do. Yeah. What are you saying about uh -huh. me? Uh-huh, all right. So I don't care if you have, you know, dual degrees in mathematics and nuclear physics mm -hmm. and you speak nine languages and you're interested in students other than just black students. Mm. Your skin color prohibits me from listening to you. Right. This is from a white faculty member. Mm. Okay, <laughs> so wow. Mm -hmm. And mm. what intervention was done? What what happened? Well, he, he left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are actually now just implementing, actually for the second year in a row, the the, the plan pro he the program. Uh -huh. Right. So we're expanding this what we call multicultural math, mm -hmm. you know, to three or four different math classes. So I yep. mean, you know, as an intervention, right? Yeah. So I can understand some of the things that could happen at the county because, I mean, one of the things you would look at, you know, if I were going to ask an obvious question like, how culturally competent is the jail? Mm -hmm. How culturally, you know, have you had, you know, racial profiling by sheriffs? Mm -hmm. Have you, you know, I mean, I'll admit, I speed. I'm from L.A., I speed. So when <laughs> I've gotten stopped by sheriffs, uh -huh. you know, here uh -huh. coming to work, you know, it's like, guy, can you watch the speed limit, uh -huh. you know? And they've been cool with me, mm -hmm. you know, Eugene, whether it's been Eugene or Sheriff's, because I've been stopped both <laughs> for speeding. Uh -huh. I don't know too many people that do the speed limit on 30th, but not excusing the behavior. Sure. Wrong. <laughs> How does um, your organization act around issues of institutionalisms? Mm. It's a great question, and the place that my mind first goes is that because of the size of Lane County government, so 3,500 plus mm -hmm. employees, and because of the land mass size of the county, Oak Ridge all the way to Florence, the I don't think there's any one way that we do deal mm -hmm. with isms. And okay. I will say that um, the closer you are from my perspective, the closer you are to the downtown building, hmm. the more likely it is that somebody might be paying attention to those okay. isms. And the further you get geographically out from there, the less likely. And, and that's a gross overgeneralization, mm -hmm. but that is to say that, um, that there are conversations happening at the table with a number of key players at the county high up. But I'm not convinced that any of those conversations or initiatives are shaping the experience of someone who's working in road maintenance in Florence mm -hmm. or yeah. shaping uh, sometimes even what's happening at the jail. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that we are an 85% unionized uh, organization. Even positions that I've never heard of being unionized uh, are. So things like some of our engineers are, are part of unions as well as so many of our uh, other employees that I'm convinced that some of the work that we need to be doing around isms is right there, you know? Right. So how do we keep layoffs from completely undercutting all of our most recent, more culturally competent or more diverse hires? You know, how do we uh, set up things like some of the protections that we have when someone is hired into a multiple languages position where they are not first on the layoff list by virtue of having that extra level of certification or that extra little credential? Right. The, how do we look at cultural competency as a dimension worth pro you know, promoting as well as keeping? Right. I mean, because it... I wouldn't presume to instruct you. Hmm. I'm glad for your ideas. But, you know, <laughs> you, know you, you mentioned lawyers, I so them. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. going there, yeah. right? All right, so here we have, so one way an organization mm -hmm. can deal with isms yep. is to understand, well, we have a history of it, yep. okay? And if we've had a history of it, it's possible that it might be a current practice that we might be not looking at. Yes. Okay? 
when you talk about unions. And so when we talk about discrimination, mm -hmm. right, by members against members, mm -hmm. right, the union is in the curious position of having to defend both. Yes, oftentimes. Right? And essentially what happens, having been in that position, is the position the union takes is essentially protecting the perpetrator. Yeah. Oftentimes. Because of union contracts. Yep. Or not acknowledging the truth yep. because of, right? So when whether we talk about, say, Eugene Police Department committing racial profiling against a city employee. Mm. Okay, it's the union that said, well, no, we're not. We can't admit that that happened. Mm -hmm. It's just your perception. Mm -hmm. Or county hired employee mm -hmm. defending, well, I can name her name because it's still public information, mm -hmm. but, you know, black probation officer, mm -hmm. okay, um, basically getting a bana rotten banana placed in her county cubicle mm -hmm. <laughs> message box, right? Uh, and already had a history at, a, at another state institution of be, having racially focused harassment, reporting racially focused harassment, that the banana incident among others, to who's her supervisor who was not supportive, mm -hmm. <laughs> came out in trial, well, yeah, he was a member of the Klan in Klamath Falls, okay, what, whatever. Um, and. The attorney saying, well, sometimes a banana is just a banana. Hmm. Now, I work with folks who do for psychological forensics work hmm. with terrorist organizations hmm. at the federal level. And I, so I asked this person, so is a banana When is a banana <laughs> just a banana? And, and she said, well, come on. No, that's clearly a racial slur. We recognize it as a racial slur. You know, when we're doing terrorist work with domestic terrorists, that is, you know, calling black people monkeys is not unheard of, and it's not the first time that a banana has been put in a box, and since I wasn't allowed to testify at that trial, but, you know, you could have expert opinion, mm -hmm. you know, could have been asked. Mm -hmm. So, union aside, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> here you, uh, what are you doing to protect this employee from when you do have a pattern? Yeah. Logically, you yeah. can have a pattern that proves that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, she's still here. You know, that supervisor's retired, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. There we go. There, there's one. So yeah. that becomes secret information among the black community because, I mean, she works on the Martin Luther King thing. And so black folks talk to each you other. And, well, okay, well, when is a banana just a banana, and when is it a racial mm -hmm. slur? And, you know, when is a noose around Obama's neck, you know, cause to act or not? Yeah. When is a cross being burned on somebody who calls in a, you know, a tip on a meth lab, mm -hmm. and somebody burns a cross on her lawn one week after 9-11? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Oh, we don't know who did that. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. So, how, yeah, how do we respond to those and do we acknowledge yeah. or what, are our unions helping us or hindering us? Mm -hmm. And then why? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there are some unions that have a past practice of actually being on the right side with civil rights yes, issues. Yes, absolutely. And working on their cultural competency. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think so much of that, again... Sorry I had to go off like that. No. Because I, mean, I know you can't say anything, really. Well, I can't say much and truthfully yeah. because I wasn't there during yeah. when it happened I have all sorts of opinions yeah. from looking in looking around looking back at the and a lot of curiosity about uh, where would I get to be when that next situation arises yeah. you know I'm curious yeah, about how right. my position gets to yeah. play into a situation like that that goes to that level and I think that um, part of my intense focus in in my upcoming year so i've just recently marked the one year anniversary of being being in this position so mm. i'm now starting to feel like okay I'm, I'm getting enough of a sense of this organization that i can start to say here are some of my goals the and then start to build some organizational development around what are the other goals in this organization that i need to suss out and be working toward and one of them is around you know managers and supervisors development training 
education around issues of cultural competency. And, you know, the, this is such a monochromatic place by and large. And so many of our uh, workforce are natives or are mm -hmm. born and raised in this region, which is a tremendous thing. And to not have life experience beyond Lane County means yeah. I don't have a lot of tools or experience or resources sometimes, yeah. some people, sometimes to some deal people. with yeah. uh, what goes on. And so how do we appropriately nip the small things in the bud? So all county employees are required within their first year of hire to receive a four-year, four-year, a four-hour. Uh, <laughs> four-year would be good. That's a Freudian slip there. <laughs> training curriculum. <laughs> Guess about my wishes. Uh, training <laughs> curriculum on issues of diversity mm -hmm. and cultural competency. And uh, we are now rewriting that curriculum. It was yeah. a curriculum developed by Peggy Nagai okay. after doing um, okay. focus groups good. with county employees. And so I think we've had a really solid program, and it's now time to sort of shift it into, okay, Okay, so most people on the job get that overt bigotry isn't going to fly. Right. Like most people right. would say that that's true. Not yeah. all. Yeah. Uh, and so then what's happened is what I think has happened all across this nation, which is Predictably, sort of yeah. uh -huh, wave two of some of this stuff, or maybe probably certainly more than just wave two, but which is the piece about, so then let's just subvert it. Let's turn mm -hmm. it into microaggressions and microoppression and yes. micro inequity. Right. And because those aren't surfacing in really obvious and overt ways, I don't see them. Or I see them and I don't have to address them. Mm. Or the one time that I addressed them, people thought that I was you know, a jerk and so then they didn't tell their funny jokes around me anymore and I don't want that to happen again, so I guess I just won't address it. Yeah. <laughs> or you know, that yeah. the, there's both lack of skills, lack of knowledge, lack yeah. of courage, and you know, certainly lack of information about how do we work against this insidious, sort of faceless, monster that is the current face but, of oppression. But is it faceless? Because, you know, mm. I, I hear that. So, yeah, l but is mm. it faceless? Okay, so mm. you use microaggressions uh -huh. by Chet Pierce. Yep. Okay, black psychiatrist, yep. Navy trained. Yep. Okay, into extreme environments, that's his thing, right? Why, what does Antarctica do to you mm -hmm. psychologically? Mm -hmm. Can't go outside, you go outside to pee and it freezes. Yeah. So, what does that do to your mind? Right? Then he basically takes that and says, being in America for black people is like being in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's the environment. It's normal. So these micro, it's not the overt bigotry that gets you. Yeah. It's the microaggressions. Yeah. Millions okay? of tiny cuts. Millions of tiny cuts. Yeah. You know, the, be the being ignored you know, at the Denny's for Clinton's Secret Service detail. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, the black guys don't get served for 45 minutes while they're right next to the white guys who get meals, you know, water, and pay their bill. When the black guy, Secret Service agents are still sitting there mm -hmm. in their suits and ties. Mm -hmm. Same restaurant, right? Adjacent to each other. Nobody called you nigger, but boom, your existence is yep. denied. Yeah. Right? So microaggressions can be actually actualized, especially because there's a pattern yeah. of them. Yeah. So if you know what that pattern is, yes. you can train people for yes. that. Right? So that's maybe the training too, or an eight hour training yeah. or whatever, which we at Lane Community College have yet to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear it, and I'm not surprised, not yeah. as a mark against Lane County. Yeah. But, so, but, you know, yeah. when we talk about, um, yeah, so I can cap on the county, but I'm also looking at, okay, my organization and going, okay, yeah. here we are, right? So, when we look at the indicators of safety in the work environment, mm -hmm. okay? So, I mean, nobody messes with me to my face directly. You know, right. I got called an uppity nigger by a faculty member by email. Mm -hmm. I got my life threatened by a student by email. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, okay, whatever. Um, there are certain departments here that you can be out as a gay and lesbian. Mm -hmm. All right, you know, lesbian baby showers. Uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Certain departments you can do that, and certain departments where that ain't safe no. at all. Yep. So people are closeted. Yep. Um, what are some of the indicators of safety in the work environment, in your work environment, and where is it safe for, mm -hmm. say, you? Mm -hmm. So two questions. What yes. are some of the indicators of safety? Yeah. The. That's a great question. 
and one that I'll take away and think about. I'll, I'll say just sort of the things that bubble immediately yeah, yeah. are things around people's everyday access and comfort and respect in the workplace. Yes. Good. However, Good. Yeah. How, how do we ever hear about those that aren't having that experience? Right. And how, you know, what's, so in public works, recently the they completed the third i think of their annual climate surveys hmm. which is something that they started doing in order to just get their finger on the pulse and to hear from workers anonymously about how is it to work at public works and there are a few questions related to institutionalized isms mm -hmm. and cool. having seen sort of a skew in response rates from male employees versus female employees they have uh, been convening a series of focus groups with the female employees to say, tell us about your experiences because here are some areas that we heard a different perspective from you than from the men around harassment discrimination or around your safety and comfort. And mm. so in those conversations that I've been part of the facilitation team as we've had those focus groups, what we've heard is it hasn't been safe to report. Okay the tallest daisy in the field gets its head cut right mm -hmm. off, you will be targeted if you say, and so we don't say. Okay. That's certainly right. one faction. Another faction has said, uh, I would say, I would tell, I would talk about my less than safe experiences, but I don't know who to tell it to. You know, so part of it is, are people getting the tools and, re you know, are we hiding the ball or right. are we saying, here's exactly the person that you would go to and here's how you do it, you right. know, or here's the form or, you know, where's the appropriate way to keep that on people's radar? Because sure, we talk about it in new employee orientation, but on your first day, you retain, you know, that much. Right. And it's four years later when you really want to tell somebody about right. it or it's four months later and, and you can't remember where those forms were. And so the... I think those are some of the indicators that that we need to be looking at. And, you know, one of the other indicators that comes to mind that's prompted by uh, the piece that you've said is around every time I send out a training email that includes Ruth Wren, Ruth Wren coming in to talk about everywhere I go I'm white, I can just count on the fact that I'll get at least 15 ugly emails threatening me. Or, you know, every time <laughs> I send out a, this is our wow. month for Communities really? of Color Network, uh -huh. um, I'll get... 15 angry emails saying, why in the world are we putting our money and resources toward this? And so... The, in hard economic times. Uh-huh. Yeah. We're laying off sheriff's deputies, but we're holding a party for people of color. Well, white is a color. That's the other <laughs> favorite thing that people like to shoot back to me to serve the Yeah, so, so show up then. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, so in terms of indicators of safety, I think that's a worthwhile question for me yeah. to spend more time on. Yeah. In terms of my own safety, the I would say that that's not one that the organization necessarily paves a way for in any sort of intentional way because yeah. we, you know, run so close to bone is their excuse right. for almost all of that. But, but in terms of personally, uh, safety in colleagues that do this work in other organizations, you know, a network of colleagues that I've come to know and trust in the county, people who have done this work for longer than me at yeah. the county just yeah. haven't ever had this label by their name but are out there right. actually pulling these these agendas along or helping people uh, operationalize or see a different model or different way of doing it every day in the workforce. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Come on now, machine. Hmm. How does your organization support your self-care? Mm. Well, I'm not sure that my organization per se does. Yeah. But to the extent that any one of us uh, who work at an organization are a microcosm of that organization, there are people who have my self-care on their radar. And one of those probably for the most... Uh, invested ways is uh, the person who directly supervises me, who's the director of HR. And I think that she has seen enough people uh, become tired of pulling the arrows out of their back or become tired of, of working such extreme hours that they uh, can no longer function healthily in the position, that she's done a good job of protecting me from no, that can't be Annette's responsibility, or you can't expect that she'll do that. That's a great question. Why don't you go research and bring it back to the group? I'm not going to put that on Annette's shoulder. Yeah. So there's yeah. some amount wow. of that. Okay. The And there are other long time and some short time really invested people, particularly that I've come to know through the work on our diversity action committee, who... Uh, who pay attention to those self-care things. So when they know that I've sent off something that's gonna 
shake people up or raise their hackles, uh, people will come and check in with me about how that's going. One of the most interesting experiences last year, the first time that we offered in January, Ruth Wren's Everywhere I Go I'm White training on institutionalized white privilege, the the amount of froth that got kicked up by that was overwhelming. So my inbox just got What kind of froth? With. Because, okay, here's the thing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, I'm a diversity trainer sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know. So when we, you know, as a person of color, when I'm basically using that material, yeah. and Ruth is killer stuff, yeah. right? Love her to be in a classroom doing that kind of stuff, yeah. right? So whether it's her, and I can include her uh, with even more advanced people, and she, you know, she would be flattered by this, you know, mm -hmm. okay. Her, Tim Wise, yep. Peg McIntosh, Chris Cullinan at the U of O, Francie Kendall, you know, the list goes on. Okay, sure. all white people yep. doing really great work, yep. scholarly work, research, detailed, I present that material and say, look, it's not me saying this. This is white folks saying white folks. And yeah. if you can't trust a white woman yeah. to know about white male culture, mm -hmm. who can you trust? Yep. I mean, really. Yep. So that's all. You know, <laughs> We ain't raising this. This is y'all talking about y'all. Yep. And this is an optional training. It's Nobody's an optional training. Nobody's your forcing you. Right? You, know, saying you, have to you could go up. as you know, just a you. point of information, yes, right? Yes, you could. And thanks. And what if it's true? Mm -hmm. What do you do then? Mm -hmm. That's all. Yep. You know, I mean, first Fridays. What, what I am working to try to understand is around why any of those emails or announcements or events provoke such extreme responses. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's incredible how obviously threatened or threatening yeah, right. it comes across. Right. And it's interesting how, how common it is to just turn around and rail against. And, and I'm fascinated by, you know, how does this feel like an accusation? How does me saying Ruth Wren is offering a training, here's the name of her training, feel like an accusation, but the most common, you know, response of coming back with anger around that is, how dare you call me a racist? The, <laughs> okay. That's the most common response. All and, right. and so in the answer around sort of some of the self-care, the first time I announced one of her trainings got back more than probably 50 email responses that were just shaken, mm -hmm. as did several of our upper administration get emails about, you know, why are we mm -hmm. paying for this? Mm -hmm. What is this about? Mm -hmm. The Bill Van Vactor, who was at that time the county administrator, said, Annette, what do we do? And I said, we talk about it. And he said, what does that look like? And I said, we host an event and ask people to come tell us why they're so mad. And much to my tremendous surprise, delight, and appreciation, he said, okay. And so and they did. we hosted a lunch, bring your own lunch. Yeah. Uh, two weeks after that first email went out and probably 50 people packed the room. Cool. Less than 10, I would probably say closer to five people were there because they were angry and opposed. Probably 45 people came because they wanted to show support for why we would host that kind of training at the yeah. county. And the bill said, you know, should I start by saying da 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 da? And I said, well, if we're there to listen, we should start by listening. So yeah. we went around the room and every person said why it was they were there and why it was they came and what they wanted to be heard about. And then with the time that we had left, we engaged in a dialogue and people shared stories and experiences. And I, certainly I think we need more of that. Hmm. The I don't know that anybody's mind was changed from that experience yeah. around the issue, right. but I do know that we need to feel heard, and until we feel heard, oftentimes we can't listen. Right. And the, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's plenty of, t you know, I mean, that's a great, too bad you didn't videotape that, because mm. that would have been a great training in itself, mm -hmm. right? You know, just mm -hmm. talking about right. that, yep. you know. Yep. I mean, you know, Tim Wise's email saying, you know, look, if Michelle Obama's, if any of those kids had turned up pregnant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we would not be having the same, you know, sweeping it under a rug. Yeah. It would be a different conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Hmm. 
Lots of final thoughts. Well, well <laughs> how can your organization better support your change agent status if you're a change agent? Mm. The, I, I think, as is true for so many um, people in a similar position, I would say resource. But I wouldn't say specifically money as the resource. Mm -hmm. I would say devote more portions of more people's time to these issues. Mm -hmm. the, that it's work that's going to take more of us. Well, backup, you know, Van Vactor's backup yeah. was, certainly, was certainly a resource. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, having that, being able to have the conversation. Absolutely. And also support the position, yeah. too. Obviously. And we have some pretty tremendously active um, departmental diversity action committees. So capitalizing and harnessing that energy so that we can sort of focus our efforts together more effectively. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Mm, it's a real pleasure, Mark. Thanks hey, for this is me. great. Time went fast. So, if uh, you like what you've seen, um, email us at liveclass at lanecc.edu. Uh, put diversity TV feedback in the subject line. Uh, if you want to request some, that somebody be on the show, have them get in contact with us through that. Um, and you know, if you, again, if you like what you've seen or didn't like what you I was saw, say, even if you don't. Hey, <laughs> Send us feedback. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday. Um, thank you for your attention. Go well. Stay well. <laughs>